If you like what you watch, then don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates on The More Show. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new weekly television and radio shows. My first guest is Reverend Lionel Fanthorpe, who has worked as a journalist, a teacher, and is an ordained independent Anglican priest. Throughout his career, he has written over 250 books, focusing on unsolved mysteries and the paranormal. Lionel, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Kevin. Now, Lionel, just tell us a little bit about yourself to begin with. Well, I was born in Norfolk, and uh, I think that uh, accent is a mixture of the Norfolk I was brought up with 30 years in Cardiff, a few years in London, a few years in Cambridge, and somewhere underneath it there lurks a little bit of standard English. Yes. That yes. was my background. Yeah. And uh, I was a journalist before I became a teacher, and then I moved down to Cardiff as headmaster of Glendaru High School here in Ely in Cardiff. And by the time our two girls had finished college and had also found themselves a nice husband each, my wife Patricia, who was also my agent and manager, right. said, we don't need that head teacher's salary anymore. Now the girls are up, they're fine. So let's go back to what we really enjoy, which is showbiz. Yep. And she got me the big series on Channel 4, you know, the 14 That's series right. that I did. And That's right, yeah. Then she got me another big series with Discovery, where we went around all the castles in Europe. And I just love radio and TV work. It's me. That's right. And you do a lot of syndicated work, of course, abroad and in America as well. As well yes, as I, source. I was on Coast to Coast at uh, 6 o'clock in the morning oh. on Friday doing a couple of hours <laughs> with George Nury. And George has a, a wonderful colleague there, Tom Danheiser, and uh, Tom phoned me and said, Lionel, you know that hour we booked you for Friday morning? I yep. said, yeah, Tom. He said, somebody has failed to come in. Can you do two hours? I said, Tom, <laughs> I would love to. So as, as a priest then, how, how did that come about? Because, you, you know, you're, you're religious, yet you do other work on the side as well. That's not so tied in with the church. Yes, it, they, they certainly... Variety is the spice of life. And what brought me into the church 20 odd years ago, it was when I was headmaster of the school in Ely, and there was a tragic accident. One of our 16 year old boys was helping his brother in his warehouse yeah. and was killed in a forklift truck accident. And although I was then just a layman and just a boy's headmaster yeah. and no connection with the, with the priesthood, I went round to see the bereaved family and did what I could for them and tried to share with them my absolute certainty that there's another world beyond this one and another life. And as I came away, the boy who had been killed, his elder sister came to the door with me and said, thank you so much, Headmaster, for what you've said to my mother. She's calmer now since you talked to her about the new world. And I felt, well, if I've been able to help one bereaved family, perhaps if I was a priest, I could help a lot more. And that's what you decided to that's do? That's what then, yeah. I then uh, decided to do my mm -hmm. training as a priest. And yeah, yeah. That's how it happened, and I said about 25 years ago. And how long was he training for? I mean, what was It's that? a bit like doing an external degree. Right. You do three years, and you know they tuck in the weekends here and the, mm -hmm. the week's course here. Yep. Um, very much like the open university <laughs> style of tuition. And you do some exams at the end of it, and then you do a year. You, you're ordained as a deacon first. Right. And a deacon cannot do all of the things that mm -hmm. are pretty, like celebrating mass, for example. And so after a year or so as a deacon, um, you then become ordained fully right. uh, as a priest. Right. So, you know, obviously a lot of the work you touch on is very sort of paranormal and spiritual. Does that mix well with the church? I mean, what, what's their there opinion? Are, there are some church people who are very worried about the paranormal, but mm. I look at it this way, that it's all God's universe. Yeah. And whether you and I are two scientists in a laboratory mixing chemicals to see what will happen um, in that spirit of objective inquiry, exactly. or whether we are investigating a haunted house or listening to someone who's had poltergeist experience, that's just a part of the honesty and the curiosity that takes us to every part of God's so, universe. So then what sort of subjects are you most into then uh, uh, in the paranormal realm and what sort of attracts you most? I'm 
particularly interested in time slips and a, a reports of what seem to be time yeah. slips. One of the classics of these was the two dear old ladies who went to Versailles, the two English school teachers who went to Versailles at the start of the 20th century and who saw a woman sitting and sketching and the scenery around them didn't seem to be totally realistic. They had this odd feeling that something was wrong, strange, different. A little while afterwards, they were in an art gallery and there hanging on one of the frames was the lady they had seen sketching in the garden and it was Mary Antoinette. Incredible. And it seems that they had somehow slipped back um, 150 years thereabouts yeah. into the time of the immediately prior to the French Revolution. Right. And another famous time slip was the one on rocks and broad. Now that's particularly interesting for researchers and you know guys like us who are keen to do fair and objective mm. investigations. Mm. The rocks and broad phenomena. Uh, two friends swimming across the broad, and this was in the 17th century and they put their account very carefully down afterwards. They said that the water had vanished and that they found themselves dressed as Romans in the middle of a huge Roman amphitheatre. And within a matter of minutes, it had all changed back yeah. and they were swimming again. A yeah. hundred years later, there was a, a clergyman and his family and they were having a picnic by the side of the broad and a strange character comes up to them and says, you are trespassing, this is Caesar's <laughs> land. And they saw the same strange things mm. that the two young men had seen 100 years before. And another instance, same place, same time, um, there was a yacht, the Amaryllis, and the yacht owner and his friends were having a party on board, yeah. and it all changes again, and they're no longer on rocks and broad. They are watching a Roman procession march past on the floor of an amphitheatre. So, so these are stories that you've gathered from, from other texts, or these, these are first-hand witnesses or well, accounts? These, or? The people who have claimed that they'd experienced those time slips, uh, that was the, you know, the two swimmers and then the clergyman yeah. a century later and uh, then the crew of the Amaryllis, uh, they all set down their experiences very carefully. And so when you're doing research, if you can get back to that sort of time period, and find that somebody has taken the trouble to write it all down. There are so many other strange cases. I said the, there were the two old ladies at Versailles. Yeah. There's the recurring phenomena in Roxham Broad. And there was a church down in Surrey, a lady making her way to church for even song in the normal course of events, and sees a very rough looking character coming towards her along the little footpath and was rather frightened. He moved away out of her path, touched his forelock and said, good evening, sister. She looked down at herself and found to her amazement that she was dressed as a nun. Within minutes, it had all faded and she was back in her normal clothes, making her way to church. It was as though she had stepped back five or six centuries just for those moments. So, so I mean, you, you've you've done so many books. I mean, we're talking about nearly uh, over 250 now, is it? It's about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, what's some of your sort of favourite um, investigations that you've done? I mean, uh, there must oh, be a, a few of key the, ones. Of the investigations, I think the one that uh, I found most, um, I won't say traumatic, because it was, but it was, shall we say, the most dynamic. Yeah. Uh, it was the uh, cinema in Bristol, and a young man there had who was one of the ushers, mm -hmm. he loved his job, but he, he was so frightened of strange paranormal things that he could see in the corridor and that seemed to be attacking him that he actually gave up his job much as he enjoyed working there. And we were called in to do uh, an exorcism. Yeah. I took a medium with me. Now, I'm as earthy as Yorkshire pudding. I'm, so, you know, I'm, a, I'm a biker and a weight yeah. trainer and a judo instructor, and fairly yeah. solid. Yeah. And, uh, as we were walking down the corridor in the cinema where our young friend had had the awful experiences, we had a medium with us who was very trustworthy and very sensitive. And she said, there's evil here, there are terrible things here. And she said, the only way I can describe them is that they look like psychic piranha fish. Right. And they attacked the boy. And she said, I can see them, they're all over it. Right. 
He collapsed against the wall, and I steadied him as he went down, and I then did a prayer of exorcism and sprinkled holy water where my medium friend was telling me she mm. could see mm. these negative entities. And as I used the prayer of St. Columba, which was, touch not thou that yep. man in God's name be gone, she said they're terrified, they're going. No, not of me, no, but no. of the power oh, of the exorcism and the holy water. Exactly, but you, you've just touched on a few things there, which we're going to talk about as well, which is the exorcism and, and, and the mediums. But how does the mediums fit in with the, the church's view? Well, again, I feel that uh, traditional religion and what I would call churchianity as opposed to real spiritual Christianity mm. is far too concerned uh, about anything it doesn't fully understand. Yeah. I believe that as long as we go into it with the, the right motive, which is to do good and to give help where help is needed, and God would far rather have us taking an interest and performing an exorcism where necessary if somebody seems to be under the attack of something negative than to say, oh no, we mustn't touch this, you know, the, way they, yeah. the way so many people shy away from it. But it doesn't worry me in the least. I said, it's just part of life. And I of think that uh, whether I'm uh, investigating chemicals in a laboratory or whether I'm investigating a haunted house, it's right. all one. So, so why, if, if that's the way you feel then about obviously the spiritual and religious uh, co context, wh why have you linked yourself to the, the religious side then? Well, I feel that the important thing in our lives is to do what we can to help others. I think the core, the heart of true religion is being able to do things for other people. Even you know, as a parent, there's nothing that gives you more pleasure than to see your sons and daughters happy together. And if we think of God as the supreme ultra parent of all of us, there is nothing more pleasing to God in the way of worship than to be kind to each other, to be helpful. So, so do you think that sort of links back then to sort of, if you help yourself, you help others? I think if you help others, you help yourself, if I can reverse right. the way you said yeah, it, yeah. because it's a very important statement you made. And the great paradox about happiness is the more that you try to give it away, the more it comes back to you. Yeah, so kind of like a karmic feel. Uh, very yeah. much. Mm. Um, one very small, simple example. Uh, I can remember at 16 or 17 passing my driving test. Overjoyed. Okay. Okay. But when I taught my wife to drive, and she passed her test, I was three times happier for her <laughs> than I'd ever been for me. And that's what I think love is all yeah, about. Yeah, that's, what, that's how you would reflect it back and everything. Okay, well, we're just going to take a short break there and uh, stay tuned and we'll be right back with Lionel Fanthorpe. Visit themoreshow.co.uk forward slash shop to purchase products and services from your favourite past guests. If you're new to this site, you can also catch up on the previous television and radio shows through YouTube and the More Show website. Welcome back, and for those who have just joined, I'm here with Reverend Lionel Fanthorpe. So, uh, Lionel, um, one of the subjects we were touching on just before the break was, um, obviously we discussed mediums in, in, mm -hmm. in bits, but um, what is a medium to you, and, and how does that work, in your well, opinion? I think that the people who are genuine, and sadly there are one or two who do not appear to be genuine, but who are trying to make money out of it or to get a little bit of notoriety, but the mediums I've worked with over the last half century have been very sincere, very genuine, very honest people yeah. who appear to have some sort of gift that uh, a number of us don't have. And one of the ways I try to explain it, at least to my own satisfaction, sure. is that if we think about the range of hearing, a dog and a bat can hear sounds that you and I as human beings can't hear. Um, a man with very, very keen sight will be able to pick out detail at a range of perhaps two miles. Yeah. Someone else may need thick spectacles in order just to read the morning paper. Mm. And so just as 
our physical vision and our physical hearing. And again, even more so if we think about the olfactory sensation, sense of smell and oh, taste, absolutely. that a, a, a chef will have a highly developed sense of taste and a, a perfumier will have a wonderful sense of smell. And there are others, of course, who have got very little of either. Now, let's just assume that in the psychic world, let's assume it exists, and that there are entities out there who were perhaps once human beings, that they are the spirits of dead human beings. There are other entities which are perhaps just non-human and non-physical, things that we perhaps refer to as demons or as angels. And most of us fail to perceive them for most of the time. But a medium has a hyper-perceptive sense right, right. and can see things, and the mediums themselves vary. You can put three mediums in the same allegedly haunted house. One will see the strongest of the impressions. Yes. Another will be able to see some weaker impressions. So that's, I, is that depending on the quality of gift they, are, they, they bring with them, I suppose? I mean, that would be my thought. That, yeah. that just as, you know, as we've been saying, eyesight and hearing can vary. So certain people have a gift of being able to perceive entities in this other plane. Right, and is that a gift that, so okay, you're saying that's a gift they're born with? I would think it's. Uh, I would think it's innate. Yes. Do, do um, we all have it? I think we all have it to a very limited extent. If, if we look at people who are visually handicapped or who have very serious hearing problems, they'd be at one extreme, and there are those of us who are what I would call rock solid pragmatists, <laughs> guys like me. Yeah. Who, yeah very, very rarely see or hear anything but depend upon a medium to accompany me to the haunted houses. And then at the other extent, you've got mediums who are so sensitive to these things that it almost makes their life difficult. So what's the church's opinion when you're sort of off to these haunted locations with a medium? I mean, how, how does that tie in? Well, some traditionalists would be very much against it and would think it was totally wrong. But for me, as I said, the whole universe is God's and wherever I tend to want to investigate yeah. and explore it, yeah. if I take a medium, I don't regard a medium as being in any way evil or in, in any way strange. It's just a man or a woman who has this gift of seeing and hearing things which are invisible and inaudible to the rest of us. Okay then, so you've mentioned here a number of times previously as well about the exorcisms. Now, tell me about your experiences with the exorcisms and where did that start for you as well? Well, it starts when somebody has a, a, a sort of a cry for help. I can remember one not a hundred yards, not, not a, a very far from our studio here in the atrium. And uh, it was down here in Adamsdown. Yeah. And there were two young single parent mums living together in an apartment, they had an apartment each in a, a house very close here. Yeah. And they came to our church and said to uh, our, our vicar that there was an old lady's ghost in their house. And that when they very bravely went upstairs, they come back from shopping mm. together, they would go upstairs, they'd, they'd see her silhouette on the window. And when they went upstairs, they heard footsteps moving downstairs and they went downstairs and then she was upstairs again, as if she was trying to evade them. Right. And my uh, colleague in the church said, Lionel, I think this is more in your line than mine. Would you go around and do an exorcism for them? So I said, yes, with pleasure. And I went round, I blessed the girls and I blessed their children. And then I sprinkled holy water in the apartments and mm. asked whatever it was there, would you please leave? You are disturbing the people who live here. So is an exorcism, is, is that sort of uh, the same as a poltergeist or are they two different things or? No, poltergeists, I think, a very different, a, a traditional exorcism would be to help uh, a spirit that has somehow got earthbound to move on to that new world which I'm certain exists and yeah. where we're going to be together again when these mortal lives are over. Place of joy and light and happiness as God promised. But the, the poltergeist, and I have my own theories about a poltergeist, mm. I think it may well be a subordinate personality in the mind of a disturbed teenager. It is almost, in every case of 
accurately recorded poltergeist phenomena, there is a boy or girl, 11, 12, 13, That's 14. That's right, it's always young people, isn't always it? Always yeah. young people, yeah. um, going through the problems of puberty, and I think emotionally stressed and anxious about some other factor, unhappy about something, and they produce these strange effects, because a poltergeist will physically move things. Yes. And if we really examine the power of the human mind, there are cases that have been done in some of the universities here and overseas, in which a group of people are trying to will a certain card to come out of a shuffled pack, right. or are trying to will a certain number up on a dice. Mm. And when enough people are concentrating on that, they can actually achieve a better than pure random result with the dice or with the cards. Right, well, I mean, I've heard with the poltergeist that you know these are spirit attachments, but you're not saying quite the same there, are you? It's, it's, in your opinion, it's something quite different. Well, I think that there may be a combination of both factors, okay. that, that a poltergeist could perhaps be an entity, some sort of elemental spirit. Yeah, yeah. But I think if that is the case, it is using the mental power of the disturbed teenager. Okay. Okay, and uh, just in general, how many exorcisms have you sort of performed? Over the years, over 50 years, not that many, 20 or 30 years, yeah. one or two a year. Right. And uh, when people get to know of you as an exorcist, yeah. they yeah. tend to, in the requests increase. I can imagine, yeah, I can imagine. And, and sometimes I suppose we can attract negative uh, entities to ourselves from what I've read in books, you know, when we use things like Ouija boards, for example. Yeah, I would... I would issue warnings about Ouija boards. They can cause awful trouble. I was, I'll give you a first-hand experience. Uh, I was with a school party who had gone to a villa in France that the school owned. Right. And halfway through supper, we were sort of relaxing, got the youngsters more or less settled for the night, as we thought. And a very frightened girl comes downstairs and says that she's seen an entity in her room. So we go back to see if we can do to help her. And she said that at the dressing table, as she had entered the room, a woman appeared to be sitting at her dressing table. Right. And when the girl got closer, the thing turned to look at her and had no face. It was just smooth pink, rather like a mannequin in a dress shop window. Yeah. And it terrified her more than if it had looked evil or unpleasant. And we mm. found then in the adjacent room some boys playing with a Ouija board. Right, so they, they could have brought this energy they into... They seem into to have brought yeah. something in with them, so I would, yeah. I would definitely counsel extreme <laughs> caution. In the, right. It seems to open a door for some reason. Absolutely, so you'd warn parents against any, anyone... Uh, it's it's the, not the a sensible... I mean, no. for, for serious scientific investigators to use one in a haunted house to try and contact something, but this would be, you've got an exorcist with you, yeah. you've got a medium with you, yeah. you've got experienced yeah. investigators. Uh, that's a very different matter yeah. from two or I mean, three. I mean, all, all that we've talked about here is very much towards the, the negative and some, some, some aspects of the poltergeist, the Ouija boards, but, but, but should we be scared of the, of the dark? <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm sure that we shouldn't. I think fear is one of their weapons. And uh, the great Martin Luther once said that the devil, if he will not yield to texts of scripture, then jeer and flout him, for that proud spirit cannot bear but, to be mocked. But then, do, do you sort of, do you believe in uh, hell and heaven, or...? Uh, do, I certainly believe in heaven. I'm a universalist, theologically. I would say that I don't believe the love of God can ever be defeated. The, the great C.S. Lewis, who wrote the Narnia series, always said that he himself had been inspired by George MacDonald. Yeah, yeah. MacDonald was a great Scots writer and a universalist, and he said in one of his books that he believed that when everything came to its conclusion, at yeah. the end of all things, yeah. even Lucifer would return penitent to God. But don't, don't you think that you can't, how could you know what cold was if you didn't know what hot was? Yeah. If you didn't have these, these, these different sort of uh, uh, polarizations, right, then how would we know the difference? How would we have experience without mm. opposites? No, I think so maybe have... they're needed, do you, know, do you know what I mean? Absolutely right. I think that one of the most important factors, well for me, theologically, is that a loving God wants us, his children, 
to experience the maximum possible happiness. And the, the greatest happiness comes from love. But Absolutely. love can only exist if we have freedom of choice. You can't buy it, you can't force it. It comes from a free heart. If we don't have freedom to choose good and evil, then we cannot choose the greatest good, which is love. Which is love, yeah, and, and, and again, that's what you would uh, say, is that what we're here to learn, just quickly, very briefly? I think so, that is yeah. what, that is what our, our life on earth is all about, learning okay. to love. And your website, just very quickly? Is World Wide Web, then my name, with a hyphen in between, Lionel-Fanthorpe.com. Okay, well, uh, Lionel Fanthorpe, thank you so much for joining us. Real pleasure. Well, to find out more about Lionel Fanthorpe, just go to lionelfanthorpe.com or visit my site, themoreshow.co.uk, and look up Lionel Fanthorpe under past guests. Well, don't go anywhere because after the break, we'll be joined more from the Extreme Hornings teams to discuss their experiences with the paranormal. Stay tuned. If you like what you watch, then don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates on The More Show. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new weekly television and radio shows.